Hello everybody, my name's Laurie Kirk and I'm from APMG International in the Canberra office and welcome to this edition of Midday Mentors. For those who've been following Midday Mentors over the last six months, Midday Mentors is an opportunity for me and uh, for my colleagues around the world to interview mentors in certain topics and today I'd like to welcome Simon Roller. Uh, Simon, how are you this, this afternoon? I'm fine, how are you? Good, good. Now, Simon, you're the lead cyber trainer and also consultant for ITSM Hub. Now, ITSM are located uh, in Australia. Um, you're located in Melbourne at the moment, aren't you? I am, yes. Uh, in, in, the, in the wonderful city of Melbourne, uh, four seasons in one day. As I as I look outside my room, I uh, often see that coming through. So, yeah, sometimes it's sunny, sometimes it's not so sunny, but no, it's, it's, it's great down here. It is, it is. And um, this is being recorded during a time of COVID. As you can see, I'm uh, Simon's at home and I'm at home. For those who are familiar, you'll see that I've changed and put a backdrop and my backdrop is the wonderful city of Canberra and that's taken their arboretum. So uh, uh, yeah, it's lovely to be able to to communicate and to share uh, where we where we live as well. Mm. But it would be nice to get back to the office, wouldn't it, Simon, sometimes? It would. It'd be nice to talk would to be. our customers face to face. Occasionally. It would be. It would be. But we're here now listening. Now, for you, if you're listening in uh, or viewing this and you're interested in cyber training, and particularly if you've been working with the NIST framework, I think the next 15 or 20 minutes so will be of great interest to you. Now, we're talking about the NIST cyber security professional. And now when we look at uh, it's called abbreviated to NCSP. So when we do an acronym of NCSP, now the NIST is the, I will read my notes, is, the, is from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, and they have actually got a cyber security framework. And APMG has now got a uh, partnered and got a certification uh, in called the NIST Cyber Security Professional. So I think I've got through all the acronyms there quite well, have I, Simon? Very know? good. That's very good. Yes. So if we're talking NCSP, that's what we're talking about. Mm. Um, before we go into that, uh, cybersecurity, uh, top of top of mind for a lot of people working from home, um, really need to be safeguard. You know, this is about everyone's responsibility. But you haven't just fallen into cyber. Get, get us a, a bit of a background of uh, your interest. Yeah, absolutely. So how we get uh, to today. I uh, I started I really started back in security back in 1990, which is really quite scary. Really, 30 years ago, Laurie. It's, mm. Let's let's say that very quickly. <laughs> we don't yes. dwell on that point. Well, my children say three decades. They they prefer to say. Oh, that's decades. great. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I like that. Anyway, <laughs> no, so no, no, no. <laughs> I started in security when I was working for Citibank in London, and, and my and my focus there was around you no know, secure trans no secure transactions and I was working for stockbrokers outside of London so it was all quite exciting in those days uh, but we had to have secure secure transmission we had to have you know cryptography we had to have, make sure our systems were available all the time so my, my initial background was really around, around IT security management if you will and focusing around secure comms then in in back in, uh, in around 2000, I was working for Hewlett Packard, and I was the the lead, uh, if you will, the 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 solution manager or practice lead in security and and risk management and uh, and continuity. So I I did a lot of work helping customers around how we do security and how we do forensics and how we build in security into the business. Uh, and of late, I'm I'm really focusing on helping organizations embed security into their frameworks. So I do a lot of work, as you know, with, with security, but I also do a lot of work with ITIL, with SIAM, with yes. the skills framework as well, So, uh, which is uh, uh, Sophia. So I, I do a lot of work in integrating cyber into all those areas as well, because that's really, really interesting. I think you're right. It's a, it is a progression, and we might, I'll put a question on notice. Uh, is the PMO of the current and the future should they include cyber? So I'll just give you a question on notice there we might come back to because I, I think we need to look at that uh, in the role of programs and projects. I'm concerned that cyber doesn't seem, what is the cyber implications of this change, doesn't seem to be front and centre. Um, you know, so, so I think you're doing a very valuable role. Would you think that that's something that we need to improve in programs and projects to, to consider that I think it needs to be improved across the whole business lorry not just in programs and projects yeah mm -hmm. so one of the one of the things I really like about 
about NIST uh, cybersecurity framework, I know that we're going to be talking a bit more about this uh, mm -hmm. in a moment, is the way that actually brings the business context into cybersecurity. You know, a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of organisations I speak to believe that you know, cybersecurity is an IT problem. Yeah, yes. and and the uh, the chief information security officer reports into the CIO because it's an IT problem. Yeah, well, yes. actually, cybersecurity is a business problem. Yeah, yes. and in in most progressive organisations, the CISO reports into the, the CEO or the board because they see it as a business issue. It's a business uh, issue. Mm. And and what's interesting is is uh, when you look at something like COVID nineteen as an example. Uh, a lot of people initially thought that COVID-19 was a health issue, yeah, and therefore it should be, it should be, it's a, it's the, it's the problem of the health department to fix. Well, actually, COVID-19 is a business issue. It affects the economies, it affects businesses, it affects people. You know, we have to think about how we identify, how we respond, how we recover. You know, how do, how do we prepare for these sort of things? Uh, and this isn't just a health issue; it's a whole of business issue. And yes. cybersecurity is very similar. You know, you need to be able to, you know, bring it across the whole organisation, the whole supply chain, uh, and not just not just IT, not just not just the PMO. So I think yeah. that's a major a major learning for, for many organisations. And this does a really good job, or the uh, cyber security framework does a really good job at actually showing that uh, to yes. organisations. It's a lovely flow on from the previous midday mentors where I interviewed a. Um, Stephen from ITSM Hub about business relationship management. So we got it, and we finished on that, which was a lovely segue into this interview that we had. That there's a, it's been an unprecedented time where business have probably appreciated more the the protection in this case, in this context, or even the services that IT provide. And and IT are probably a little bit more cognizant of well, what what are some of the issues that business do? You know, you know business are trying to be careful not to hit on links. So I, mm. I think we've got a unique opportunity here to. Say, look, we've we've done a we've got through this. We're working remotely. How can we improve? Um, mm, and, and, I, and I think it's a, a a great time. And I I also um, you know know that we're going to have unprecedented after the recession, and we do have a recession in Australia. It's official um, that after the recession we will have unprecedented growth. Now we don't want to have unprecedented growth without the checks and balances. Do any comments on? Absolutely, on, absolutely. Yeah. No, what's what's really what's really important. Is um, when we look at uh, you know, cyber security and, and and security as a whole, we take a risk based a, a risk based approach to what to what it means. Like I was I, I was talking to uh, uh, an organisation a while ago, and they were talking about security and think about cyber and what should they do. And I and uh, I gave them my advice as to you know what are the the key functions they need to be looking at and the sort of posture they need they need to be uh, uh, working to and they go yeah but we're a small company now we've got 10 15 people we've got 20 people now what you're suggesting is we actually invest in these you know really quite key areas and I go absolutely because it's based on the risk that you have to your assets and your assets in this particular organization were health records financial records right. personal information I said I said you need more security than Rio Tinto yeah, mm -hmm. because of the assets that you're actually mm -hmm. your assets and the security mm -hmm. of those assets are so much more important than just digging yeah. things out of the out of the ground. I'm saying I'm sure Rio Tinto has quite a lot of security, yeah. but, but it's, you're right. Uh, the value of the asset as a percentage to the net value of the company is quite massive for that small and medium. So the net value to the consumer and the citizen. Yeah. So yeah. Yes. No, the uh, so you really need to think about that and 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 having a risk based approach to to cyber security is very very important uh, as yeah. opposed to a traditional compliance based approach which is basically you know i had to say it, uh, checks and balances they are useful but it, but they but they won't they won't help you from a from a an ongoing cyber perspective now we've got to yes. think about you now look at the risk and maintain that risk and uh, and that's what it's all about so when we're talking about the you know i'm looking at this is the the um, uh, NCSP, the NIST Cyber Security Professional. With we're talking about NIST, is it correct? What what attracted you first of all to that when you saw this as a new certification coming on the market? When you looked at it and said, I, I really think this is something I'd like to get into. What what was your initial attraction? Well, I'm a bit of a framework geek. I love I love my frameworks. I love I love my best practice, Laurie. Uh, has been known, yeah. And 
I love my idol. I love idol. Yeah. I've loved it for many, many years. I like, I, I love Siam. I help contribute to the development of Siam. Uh, I love uh, Sophia. Just for, those, that's, just for those who may not be familiar, Siam is uh, service integration and management. Okay, yeah. how you manage yeah. multiple multiple okay. service providers. And okay. and I and I and I love the skills framework, Sophia, and I love Cobit, the control objectives uh, that comes from a cycle. So I love all those frameworks. Mm. And what I and what I loved about the NIST uh, framework uh, around cybersecurity was. Now it's really it's really written really well. You know, it's it has these five functions around uh, identify, protect, uh, detect, uh, respond, and recover, which are very simple to understand, and it really really speaks volumes to what an organisation needs to do. So it's written in very simple language in relation to you know the business people will understand it. Not suggesting that business people are simple, but mm. now we, we do have an ability within IT to overly complicate things with acronyms. Right. Uh, <laughs> Here's me just using about 15,000 of them. Uh, but uh, so it's written very well. But it's also what I do love about it. It actually references a number of other international uh, recognized uh, uh, references and uh, uh, informative references, they're called, which are actually very, very useful. So it does reference things like ISO 2701. Uh, and it does reference, uh, you know, things like COBIT, and it does reference the uh, the Centre for Internet Security uh, 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 security controls, which I've obviously there are twenty. So these yes. these these are really really good references for organisations. So it uses the inform the informative references really really well, and and things like yes. COBIT does the same. Uh, it, it uses really good language, which which makes it easy for people to understand. Uh, it does focus around risk. It does focus around understanding a risk profile, not just a compliance profile. Okay. All the big, now many of the big attacks that we've had over over the years have been have happened to organisations who have been compliant. Yeah, they've yes. done their checks and balances. They've done yes. their security compliance. They've got the tick in the box. They've got the little plaque on the wall that says we are compliant, but they still get hacked. Yeah, and it's like and it's because they've become overly overly complacent if you will on that on that compliance checking to go well actually there's more to it than compliance yes. uh, and it's and it also does take a very much a business theme to it uh, okay. and lastly as well i think it's it's incorporated many of the 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 uh, the learnings around agile around culture around uh, uh, business transformation and digital transformation. So all these things are included within within the cybersecurity framework. So I think it's really, really good. So when you when it's come out, when we talk NIST being the National Institute of Standard and, Techn uh, and Technology, okay. uh, that's from the US, I believe. Right. So, yeah. Yep. So we get into this. Is there? I think that's a huge advantage because uh, you might elaborate on some of the the requirements that are coming out of the US in cyber, but we're in a danger though. We've got this still have a mentality that, oh, that's from the US, it's not applicable for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think nothing could be further than the truth, isn't it? We, we Absolutely, know? absolutely. What this has done as with the uh, cybersecurity framework is, uh, is actually used this, these informative references. So if you like ISO, then you've got 27001. If you like COBIT, then you can, mm -hmm. you can include that. Uh, there are other informative references that are going to be brought online as well. So you can choose the informative reference, uh, which actually gives you the detail, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. that, that you want to use. But what NIST does, it does give us that overarching view uh, around uh, you know, what an organisation should do. Uh, and it isn't, it isn't focused in any one particular area. You, mm -hmm. you can use it for small organisations and large organisations, but I think for Australia, it's really, really important. Yeah. Look, I know that also we uh, I dealt with a little bit of cyber work about two years ago, and particularly in defence. If I one of the biggest questions I got was, is it compatible with the NIST? You know, mm. yes, it is, and we had to demonstrate that because a lot of the uh, American uh, companies and close defence links they won't touch it unless it's actually got something you know uh, shows that it's NIST compatible. So if anyone's listening, that you know, I think if you've got a in the defence network or working for defence. I think this is important that you really get some training or some some guidance in how this framework can be used. Um, mm. That's what I've seen. Can I just ask one one question there that the uh, the it is um, being promoted as the industry's first accredited training program designed to help organisations and uh, and and other organisations implement the NIST secret framework. It's actually the first accredited training program um, that mm. put this together. Um, I think that's fantastic. It's it's begs the question why wasn't done before? 
Uh, and I think I think the reason why no, I think there has been a lot of uh, you know there's a, a bit of a, a, a feudal elements to these things in terms of this not invented here thing. Uh, you know, many organisations have a, you know, or many countries have their own particular flavours hmm. of things in relation to what we should be doing. Is it a body of knowledge? Is it a standard? Is it a framework? And we've had all those discussions. Yeah, I think what we've what we've tried to do with what's happened with NIST is it's been it's been built in a very pragmatic way. Like I don't I don't know if you know, Laurie, this the the reason why we have NIST was because of an executive order that was created by uh, President Obama uh, back in the uh, no, uh, uh, no ten years ago or so. Yes, ten, and, eight nine years, yes. That's yeah. right. And and basically it was that was because of a number of compromises that happened in the US. So basically he said, you know, we need to make something. We need to be serious about doing this properly. We need to build something that could be used across across all of our critical infrastructure. So mm -hmm. it was is really focused on around those 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 critical infrastructure elements within uh, within the US. But he said, but it needs to be something that can be that can be adopted and adapt. No, that, that could be. Uh, uh, adopted and adapted to meet the organizational needs yeah yes. so it isn't just a one size fits all you know it's very much about you know people understanding what's right for them and we have these things called implementation tiers uh, which basically is a very pragmatic way for an organization to understand where they are in relation to their cybersecurity posture uh, and then you have these profiles and the profiles allow you or, or help you to understand how you get from where you where you are right now based on your tier uh, to where you need to be based based on your right. on what is your appropriate posture moving forward. Yeah. So so these are really carefully. pragmatic, pragmatic said, ways it can be you've used. You said that quite a few times. So if anyone interested in, in this course, if you are a small to medium enterprise or whatever, you know, you're looking for something that can be understood. I'm hearing that from you a few times. So that's uh, it's making the NIST framework um, applicable to your. It doesn't matter whether you're in Australia or New Zealand or Kuala mm. Lumpur. Um, it is making that, uh, you know, please don't just think it's all oh, the NIST, it's, it's US based. And I really like the point that you made that it, it easily accepts whatever other approach that you like to use, 27001, COVID, etc. So I think that's a, a really important takeaway point. It is, it is, Lloyd. And the other thing which is really important as well, uh, and again, if you look at some of the you know, the recent attacks that we've had or the compromises that have, that, that have occurred, that the, the, the the, uh, the cyber actors you know, they they attack they won't go they won't go through the, through the front door yeah they know that's where the locks are they know that that's all been reinforced they know there's the people looking at the front door they're going to go through the back door okay mm -hmm. and the back door in this context is they're often going to go through uh, through through suppliers okay so, yes. so they're going to understand the supply chain in relation to where an organization gets their services from where that organization gets their services from and they're going to go for the weakest link and then yes. and that's and that's the way that they and and that's the way that they work so they yes. start off with a small organization who who hasn't got the appropriate security posture uh then they use that to gain access to their environment and they use that environment to gain access to their target uh, so so if you're in a supply chain this is really important and particularly if you are in a supply chain that has a relationship even if it's second third or fourth hand of defense or to a u.s company I believe there is legislation that anyone doing business with the US company has to show competency with NIST. Has that now been passed? I know it was up to the Senate. And do you know where that was heading? To be honest, Lloyd, I don't, I don't actually, have, I haven't really focused on that. But, I might uh, do that later on, I might check up on that because I think mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot of US companies won't do business until you can demonstrate an understanding of. So that's where mm -hmm. NCSP could be really handy for you to say, and oh, by the way, we are cognizant, we've done training in the uh, NCSP professional um, and we're by that. So it's very also, easy to sell. Um, I also think that's also happening as well over here for even for, for Australian based organisations who have nothing to do with the US. That yes. same supply chain risk uh, yes. or service provider risk is still there and it's probably it's, it's and it's called out quite strongly inside NIST. But it's also it's about understanding that all your service providers need to be uh, need to be you know, accredited or they need to have the, uh, uh, an appropriate posture uh, defined in relation to uh, yes. to uh, uh, cyber. I just going to look at. Let's think about the actual course. Um, I'm only going to uh, when we go through. What's the format? Uh, what's it like? If I'm interested, uh, um, the professional course. How many days? What format? Um, mm. What sort of thing can I expect? 
Okay, so no, right now it's uh, it's an evolving environment, which is good. So the, the, the current course is that we have a, a foundational level and a and a practitioner level. So that the uh, foundational level is, is like a one day course right now. Uh, now that said, now I think ITC and Mahab are looking to make that a bit longer maybe, uh, purely so we can get some more practical examples and yep. we can provide some more context. So yes. you know, in, in many instances, context is king. So we want to be able to provide those you know, working case scenarios and provide more context for the Australian market and for our customers who who are wanting to look at this, so we can actually give them a better a better understanding. So we may look to you know extend that 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 one day course, but it's generally a one day course uh, instructor led for the foundation. And then the practitioner one is more of a deep dive, if you will, into you know how you actually implement NIST uh, inside an organisation. Now and it focuses on the CIS. Uh, uh, CSC 20 controls uh, and that's more like a four day course. Again, it's 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 not so much four days of PowerPoint. It's uh, it's a uh, only a maybe a 20 percent increase in how many slides we have from the foundation. But it's a lot more practical examples. So it's really around getting talking about the issues, going through uh, use case scenarios and leveraging some of the experience in the room. So again, we offer that we would be offering that as a instructor led course as well. But, you, but both both courses are available for both instructor led, but also uh, self study computer based training as well. OK, but the that's fine. But I think the joy is, that, as you can probably gather, that you've got an expert like Simon who's got a wealth of experience. That's one of the, the things you get from an instructor led course. We're talking about instructor led, obviously, um, Classroom when classrooms open up. What about virtual training? Is that an option that we're exploring? Um, Absolutely. No, yeah. I think I think what we've learned uh, through through uh, no, our our challenging times, as, as I call them, uh, is that you know we can actually work quite effectively uh, in a, in a collaborative environment uh, mm -hmm. uh, online. Uh, so I've done many courses, both ITIL and non ITIL, uh, uh, in a in a in a virtual environment, we can create exercises, we can do breakout rooms, we can have yes. a really, really good discussion. Yeah. So I think that I think that's really good. You know, yeah. we have to think a bit more about how we do that you know, and and getting information to our to our to our students in a in an efficient, effective way. Uh, but you know, it's, it's certainly doable and we it's certainly get that, that conversation and you, happening. And you would probably I know like other providers, you know, you will look at how to structure the course to, you know, it, what says four days is actually you might say sessions, you know, so we'll have this session time because now, but it does go quickly. You know, when you when you've got an inter, you can go into a breakout room, you can break the session, you can you know make sure you plan it out accordingly. But it also helps people that maybe you know, particularly where we are in Australia. You're in Melbourne. If we we take a vertical look through for the time zone, plus or minus two hours, mm. you know, it does open us up to you know the Southeast Asian market uh, as well. So there's no reason. Oh, oh no, other people coming through. It really helps in terms of also getting critical mass because these yes. things really work if you've got uh, no more than more than two people. Yeah, so yes. you now if yes. you want to get a a diverse group of people with a lot of experience together, we want you know five or six, maybe ten people uh, in a classroom. Yes. Yeah, uh, and having a virtual classroom allows us to do that. Yeah, whereas getting people to travel you know, in a class in a physical classroom environment, getting yes. ten people may may be a bit of a challenge. Yeah, because we all yes. we all work in you know we're all very very busy. So you now that virtual that virtual uh, capability certainly opens up the ability to get more collaboration happening uh, across, I would say, multiple time zones, but also multiple multiple locations as well. Yeah, and I think that's the point that we've had feedback from people who are doing this virtually. That uh, uh, okay, our New Zealand uh, brothers across the uh, sisters across the the ditch um, saying, well, it means we we have to go a bit later, but they're enjoying the ability because quite often. You know, this opens up that, that approach to New Zealand. Uh, also, I've had feedback from people from, you know, when they go through from Perth, you know, as well, they said, yep, it's a, we can work with that time frame. Seems to be that magical plus or two, plus or minus two hours or three hours. But I have had reports from providers that said I had a person who was uh, happy to do it in the early mornings, uh, in the evenings in the UK. Uh, so we never, you shouldn't just assume that someone's not no. in the time zone um, no. because they really enjoyed the, experience of having eight or ten people sharing their screen and sharing their experiences mm. um, mm. it, it enriched their learning um, mm. absolutely so is there a, just on that the there's an examination um, that, that comes with that uh, so at the course so we, you have there, is. there is so there's a there's a a, a, a foundation course uh, I think it's uh, I think it's 40 uh, 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 
40 questions for the foundation of 65, I think, for the practitioner. Yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, so they're, they're, they're all very good. No, it's, and there's uh, staff online as well, so people correct, can do exam correct. online. And then they get an, an e-certificate, they've passed, that to be positive, they've passed, and they get an e-certificate, but also a digital badge, and that's mm. something that, that goes out there so you can share your success. Um, mm -hmm. I was Absolutely. asked, uh, I told a colleague that I was doing this interview and this person was very interested to say, I'm an entry level person and I'd really like to try and crack into the market, but just to show that I'm aware of things. Do you think the foundation course would be helpful for that person who wants to try and break into the market? Absolutely, Laurie. I think I think in, I think it is exactly where people people should be going because uh, it is like it is it's valid for business people it's, it's valid for it security professionals it's, it's valid for you know vendors and supply and contract managers as you look at that that supplier risk element you now for, for consultants as well who actually want to who want to work with other uh, organizations in this space so it's actually it's actually you know uh, valid for many many different people it is it is not at all uh uh, confronting in terms of the language, in terms of the knowledge, you don't yeah. need to have green hair and be doing a, a be a, 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 no, a, a part of a red team or a blue team or you no know, a white hat or black hat hacker. Yeah. You know, it, it's actually it, no, there are the, it's actually quite easy to understand. There yeah. are some technical elements to it, but you don't need to know those technical elements in order to pass the exam or to get the foundational knowledge that you need uh, to actually get some value out of out of the uh, cyber security framework. One of the areas that I'd like if anyone's listening that I would like to focus on and we will be focusing on is anyone listening that has a graduate program and very much I I know that I've just lectured some people the other week and they were in the graduate program and they do a rotation through and often they'll elect to do a rotation through the IT area or a business related area. I think mm. this would be fabulous for them to at least come out of that rotation to say yeah. I also attach it so they can say, yeah, I learned this, but I applied it. Mm. Um, so it's a bit of a plea out there. If anyone's interested in running a graduate program in your company uh, or in a government mm. department, uh, I think we should you should contact Simon or myself. I think this would be a brilliant um, thing to do on a rotation. Absolutely, uh, Laurie. Like uh, I was talking to uh, an individual today, actually, I was doing a, a Sophia assessment of an, of an individual, and he actually asked me about, you know, what should, he, what, should he, what should he be focusing on moving forward? And I go, yeah. you know, and I go, yes, because now the individual, lovely chap, had a you know, good understanding of ITIL and he'd done all the, the foundation courses. And I go, that's really good. Now, anyone, in my view, anyone who's working in IT should have a, you know, at least a foundational understanding of IT service management and ITIL is a great place to go. And I go, but that's just, that's just, a, ticket, that's just a ticket to the dance. Yeah. yeah if you want right. to get a date, you got to have something special, and to yeah. me, that's where cyber comes in. Yeah, yeah. and and it, it does give you something uh, unique, something different, some uh, a new a new capability. But you know, Laurie, in five years' time, that's going to be a ticket to the dance as well. Yes. Everyone's going to need to know cyber. Yeah, yes. in any role uh, that even touches digital technology, digital transformation, IT, supply chain management, you're yeah. going to need to understand cyber. Yeah, not maybe to an expert yes. level, but the bit, the basic concepts of it and how it all works and the responsibilities that that people will have. Now that will be the ticket to the dance. I think also to to answer that young fellow who who asked asked me about it, I said, look, um, anything that you can go to a recruitment agency and say, oh, and by the way, I am NIST. I've got an understanding of the NIST framework, which is being used in defence, etc. It could be just that edge that gets you that job. So absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Well, you've answered my last question, which was who should attend and why. And I think we've, we've looked at it. I think the, the two different levels, it's a lovely progression. We've answered the question, everybody, that it's uh, it's there. To be, it's, it is not a, you don't have to be an IT person. It's certainly, I think you've heard Simon's word that it's uh, incredibly pragmatic um, and it gives you an understanding. I think if you're a small to medium enterprise, it's also good for you to understand that this could really enhance your opportunities to be in a supply chain uh, mm. regard. Mm. I think that, that just just to that point, Laurie, mm. I think it's like anything. If if people, like I used to be an auditor as well, I, I'm a systems auditor. Now, when I, I used to get really, I don't generally get grumpy, but I, I used to get a bit grumpy sometimes when I speak, I, I kind of speak to a customer and I do an audit and they the way they, they tackle their risks is by, no luck, uh, luck and goodwill. Yeah, in terms of yeah, it's like 
Now, if, if someone decides not to do something because they've understood the risks, they've weighed it up, they looked at the business value and they've decided it's not worth it, I think, okay, good on you. Yeah, okay? You're showing good cause, you're showing good That's intent. Right. That's yeah. right. But if you've actually not done it because you didn't know anything about it in the first place, that's just incompetence. That's yeah? incompetence. And that makes me grumpy. Yeah? yeah. So I think everyone should understand and own view as to what is right for them. But use you know, informative reference and use best practice and, and, and use some some knowledge to make that judgment call. Yeah. We don't all have to be, you know, the uh, Fort Knox in relation to security. You know, we don't have to be the experts at everything. But let's make an informed judgment as to yes. what's right for you, and then that will support you moving forward. So, so this is where, and this is where that foundational view actually comes in. Excellent. Well, Simon, um, I hope you can, people listening to this, uh, one of the advantages of instructor-led is that you do get exposed to true mentors and true experts. And today, um, I'd really like to thank you, Simon, for your time. Um, we've covered uh, an interesting new certification that's coming into Australia, and I'm sure that we could then look at uh, ways that this can get into your organisation. So, Simon, uh, thank you very much. There will be connections. Uh, there'll be any other final words, and then I'm going to do a close. Oh, just just say thanks, Laurie. Now, this is a really good uh, this is a really good uh, opportunity and a really good service that you that, that yourself and APMG provide. It's it's great that we can actually have these have these chats and these forums and uh, keep doing keep doing the good work. Okay, well, thank you. We we do enjoy it because one of the things that you'll find there'll be connections for both ITSM Hub, who are located in Australia, but as you can see from the virtual learning, ITSM Hub could certainly train uh, virtually if you look at that plus or two plus or minus two hours time zone. Um, the the experience that you have heard from Simon uh, tonight uh, is uh, where you and his experience as an auditor. There's lots of examples where you could ask where this particular certification could help you. I think it's a goal that we should work together with ITSM Hub uh, into making sure that we can probably get this into some graduate programs. So I very much look forward to, to a continued work. Well, I'm drawing this to a close. Thank you very much, Simon, for the, uh, the, the great insight that you've given to this particular new cyber certification that's come into Australia. And we certainly look forward to seeing uh, what else, uh, what other organisations uh, will be actually taking you up on the offer uh, to make such a great certification available to their staff. Thank you very much for your time.